reading from the law comes from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 5. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 5. After we've read that passage, we will turn over to Isaiah and read an extended text from Isaiah chapter 40. Exodus chapter 20, and verses 1 through 5. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for the Lord your God is a, uh, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. And in Isaiah chapter 40, and we'll begin reading with verse 9. Isaiah chapter 40, and beginning with verse 9. Go on up, excuse me, go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span? Enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are, in, or, nor are its beasts enough for a, a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? An idol. A craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts for it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Had you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretch out the heavens like a fountain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these, he who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name by the greatness of his might because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is, everlast is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint nor grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Last week, I quoted Calvin 
who said that the human heart is an idol factory. And so you see evidence through all of this history that uh, human beings find ways to create and worship lesser gods. Sometimes these are not pagans worshiping le lesser gods, but they are Christians, believers, imagining that the idols that we make, that the images that we use as aids to worship, actually enhance our worship when actually they diminish it. But nonetheless, even Christians will find ways that we need to revise our thinking and stop imagining him as less than he is. Because when we imagine God to be less than he really is, it can have devastating consequences with regard to our living and our faith. So when someone might ask the question, we've been working our way through the Ten Commandments, we're just getting started, we're only on number two, but somebody might ask the question, which is the most controversial of the ten? And someone will say, I know the most controversial, it's the seventh. Because with all the debates going on in our culture around uh, sexual uh, issues and so forth, that's the one that's really controversial, that gets people uptight. Somebody else might say, well, the really controversial one is the fourth. The one about the Sabbath, because even most Christians don't pay much attention to the Sabbath anymore anyway, and some don't even think that it's relevant under uh, the New Testament. So the fourth is the most controversial. Arguments can be made supporting either of those and perhaps some of the others, but I would suggest to you that the most controversial of the Ten Commandments is the second. The one that is before us today. Uh, there, there are multiple reasons that I, I say that. Uh, I, I once was a member of a Sunday school class that was studying the uh, book by J.I. Packer, Knowing God. It's a wonderful classic. If you've, not, uh, recommend, if you've not read it, I could recommend it. But uh, the Sunday school class that I was attending, I wasn't the teacher, thankfully. But uh, when they got to Packer's chapter on images, the class went into vigorous debate that became so heated that one of the families in the class left the church um, following this debate over whether it was okay um, to use um, images, crucifixes, and things such as that as aids um, in their personal devotion, devotional life. Um, the, the use of images among Christians is so widespread that many would have uh, would express shock that anybody has any trouble with it at all. Um, after all, images of the Godhead appear in many places in in churches, even in stained glass windows and in other kinds of imagery. And so, it's very common to see in religious literature, in stained glass, in other kinds of places, uh, religious venerations that include depictions of members of the Godhead. I just mentioned the book by uh, J.I. Packer, and it was interesting that when an updated uh, edition of that uh, book was published in the 90s, he added an addendum to that chapter on images because he had received so much pushback on that particular issue. And so it, it was controversial to the point that uh, while most of the rest of the book was uh, limited in a, edited in a very limited way, he added an addendum uh, to that chapter. Uh, nowadays, it is common in one confessional Presbyterian denomination for candidates for licensure or ordination to take exception to our standards with regard to what they say about the use of images as aids to worship. And so even among Presby young Presbyterian ministers, it's become common to say what our standards say with regard to the use of images is not something um, that I agree with. And so this is, in fact, a controversial um, issue among many. And yet, even though, and, and, and that's just thinking about images themselves. If we move beyond that central issue and think about the idea that the second commandment ought to have broader implications for the way that we worship, 
That is something that's not thought about very much, and all of the debates over worship wars and, some, and so forth rarely include expression of thoughts related to the relevance of the second commandment. And so it's important, uh, and it's controversial is what I should say. And so next week we'll look at some of the negative side of this, the thou shalt not. But the question could be raised, if we're using images not to worship a pagan idol, but if we're using images to worship the real God as, as aids to our faith, as ways to help us to worship God, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that anyway, to use, uh, with, with using... It, like, like the Israelites did at the foot of Sinai, when they made that golden calf, they weren't creating a new God they were going to worship. They were using the golden calf as an aid to worship Jehovah, the one that Moses was with up on the mountain. What's wrong with that? Or if we have depictions of God in our Christian books and so forth, what's wrong with that? Why can't we do that, have images of the Godhead to help us worship? Well, it's important to recognize that along with the thou shalt not, that there is a positive duty. We aren't to use images to help us worship God because God is so great that he cannot be captured by the image. God is so great that only when we think of him with regard to what he's revealed to us, and don't try to reduce it to images, can we really understand something of who he is? Because the idols, the images, always leave something out. They always, re they always reduce who he is. And so it's that reduction that is the reason for forbidding idols. And the positive duty is to understand and respond to and worship the greatness of God. Because when we worship him in his greatness and in his glory, then we will recognize that no idol is sufficient. And that is the message that Isaiah is communicating in the 40th chapter uh, from which we read. And so first of all, I would have you to notice from that chapter in, in chapter 40 of Isaiah, to notice the invitation. Isaiah writes, go up, on up uh, uh, to a high mountain of Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold your God. And then Isaiah provides a series of depictions of God's greatness. If they are to behold their God, this is what they are going to see. And so in verse 10... He describes God's power. Behold, the Lord God comes with might. In verse 11, he describes God's tender care. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. In verse 12, he describes God's immensity. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or marked off the heavens with a span? In verse 13, he describes God's spirituality. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord so he cannot be reduced to the physical? In verse 14, he describes God's wisdom. Whom did God consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and wisdom and so forth? In verse 14, again, he describes God's wisdom. Um, who taught him the path of justice, knowledge, and the ways of understanding? And in verse 15, he describes God's rule. Behold, the nations are like a drop in the bucket before him. And so he says, behold your God. And then he has this full picture of the greatness of God taking in his power and taking in his careful love like a shepherd pulling up a sheep uh, to his bosom. And so God is described in his greatness and in his power and his love and so in light of that invitation and what it reveals, Isaiah then describes the inadequacy, starting in verse 18. He says, To whom then will you liken God? 
Or what, what likeness will you compare to him? And then he responds to that question, which evidently was not rhetorical, but he responds to it by saying, well, an idol. And then, so then he describes the idol maker and he puts the idol maker in the best possible light. And so you see that there's an emphasis on the fact that the idol maker was skilled. He was a skilled craftsman. This is not shoddy work that's being done. And then not only is it skilled, it's sacrificial. If somebody is uh, wealthy enough, they use gold and silver. If somebody's impoverished, they get a good quality wood, and they do the best they can with the resources that they have. And so it's skilled. It's sacrificial. And in the combination of skill and sacrifice, you can see that it's, it's sincere. They want to do something that's really worthy of aiding them in worship. And so the idol maker, the one making the image to compare to God, is skilled. He's sacrificial. He's sincere. And he's simple. Because in verse 21, you have the rebuke. Do you not know? Do you not hurt here? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sits upon the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are as grasshoppers. Make an idol of that. And so God's greatness that was described beginning with verse 9 is something that's far too great to be captured in an idol because God is incomparable. Um, he cannot be compared with any physical thing that is made. So what's the attraction of idol worship? If it's so clearly forbidden in the second commandment, and by idol worship, again, I'm not talking just about those that are pagans that worship trees. I'm talking about those that use images of God that use inadequate worship of God in their churches. What's What's the enticement of that? And I want to mention a couple of things and then we'll move toward our conclusion. People are attracted to idol. And we find it, by the way, all through the Bible, including in David's household with Michael, with Rachel um, stealing, uh, the wife of Jacob stealing her father's household gods. So we find it through the Bible and through Christian history. What, what's the enticement? Well, I'll, I'll mention a couple of things. One is, that even if people think they know better, people believe that they find comfort in a God that they can see. Holding this crucifix in my hand, um, having a shrine where I do my daily devotions, having a depiction of God provides what is regarded as, um, as something that has value, that aids worship. Second, though, and this is important because it's sinful and spiritually dangerous, the use of an idol gives us a sense of control over our God. It can be discomforting to think that God controls us and not the other way around. But if we make an idol and put him in his place, we have a sense that we actually control our God. And, and along with that, the, the use of idolatrous images also goes along with attitudes that give people a sense of guarantee that they can get what they want if they use the right formula. So instead of God being in control and us submitting to his will, we can use the magic words and God will submit to our will. Have you ever known folks, and, and I'm giving examples that are real to life, it's not my intent to laugh at anybody or to mock folks that, that I'm sure are Christians. So that's not my intent, but listen carefully. Have you ever known folks that when they prayed, they were sure that if they, they prayed in a certain way that God had to answer their, pray, their prayer? It's like if I turn on the faucet, water's got to come out, right? And so people, they'll read the passage that says that if we ask anything in Jesus' name, 
Which means if we ask anything in accordance with his character and will that God hears our prayers. But people twist that and make it as though if we use the right magic words, then God has to do what we ask him to do, tell him to do. Have you ever known folks that prayed and when they pray, they say everything else in one uh, tone of voice and a certain level of loudness. And then when they say the words in Jesus name, it's 10 decibels louder than what they've been saying, praying. It's as though those are the important words because if I say it and say it loud enough that God hears me, then he's got to do it, right? And let's be clear. These are folks that mean well. They're believers every bit as much as you and I are believers. But that, that, has more to, that sounds more like the Baal worshipers at Mount Carmel. That Elijah said, why, why is God not sending fire from heaven? Is he asleep? Do you need to wake him up? To go to the restroom? What, what's the deal? Why is God not answering your prayer? And then when Elijah prayed, fire came from heaven. And so the, the use of images, the use of false forms of worship leads to a view and understanding that we control God instead of understanding that we are submitting to the will of a God that controls us. Now the supposed payoff of idols that are the reason, the incentives, the, the control, the location, the, uh, and so forth, these actually uh, are things that are impoverish the lives of Christians. When we understand God's greatness, that is a source of strength and courage for us. When we fail to recognize God's greatness, it's a source of spiritual poverty. And we see that around us all the time in sad ways. We see it when Christians that walk through the valley of the shadow of death have a crisis experience over their faith because they were not prepared to, they didn't have a God that had prepared them for a time like that. I was reading an interesting book a couple of weeks ago that dealt with the doctrine of assurance. The Puritans who lived during a time when mortality was much greater and much younger than it is today. In Puritan literature, you find no zero examples, zero examples of people that had a crisis of faith. I'm not sure I can believe in God anymore because they realized they were about to die. In our world, we see that happen among Christians on a frequent basis where the reality of death creates a kind of crisis. And I would suggest to you that the difference is the kind of preparation that's provided in churches and the understanding of the greatness of God. We see the, the, um, we see the effects of our impoverished worship on when we see the sense of panic over our cultural moment. When we look like spiritual pygmies that fail to realize that God reigns supreme even in our adversity. The God, the God who called the king, the pagan king Nebuchadnezzar his servant is not cowed by any leader in the modern world. We see the effects of, of worship that does not emphasize the greatness of God when we um, see that Christians who fear or Christians who hope that their way is hidden from God and don't recognize that the scripture says that even if I descend into hell, God is there. There's no place I go where he is not there with me. And so verses 29 through 31 conclude this chapter that exposes the greatness of God to people that had been suffering. These are people that had been suffering the judgment of God. Now God was promising to restore them. And so after describing God's greatness, Isaiah closes by saying, He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. 
Even you shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall, uh, shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This time of year is one in which many people think about graduation ceremonies, not just these two. I, Lynette and I also were at a graduation this week, and maybe others of you as well, either high school or college. Have you noticed that uh, there is an emphasis that they want, they want the um, graduation time to be festive for those that are graduating? But there's all, there are also elements of a graduation service that emphasize something serious is happening here. The occasion is something that is such that there are traditions, there are ways of doing things that need to be done in order to prove the seriousness of what we are doing. And while sometimes things get out of hand, especially when they're calling all the names and all that, there are many parts of the service that are intended to convey the seriousness of what is happening. A um, graduation ceremony is not a pep rally. They are two very th different things because the emphasis is on the seriousness of the occasion. The graduates march into uh, the music uh, pomp and circumstance even though Casey Kasem never announced that as a top 40 billboard hit. And probably none of us have ever bought a CD and said, you know, I, I love pomp and circumstance, had to have this in my car. But it's a tradition that shows that the occasion is seriousness. The pronoun is serious. The, the, the pronouncement that the students have met the requirements for graduation from that school and from the state of Texas is a matter of uh, great seriousness and somberness, even as it also is a celebration. The occasion trumps issues of taste. Isn't it interesting that in many churches today that taste is the only consideration with regard to how worship is conducted? I would suggest that when we think about taste, and entertainment value and fail to consider the seriousness of what we are here to do which is to meet the God that created Canis Major and Canis Minor. When we think about the seriousness of what is happening that doesn't mean that we can't also be festive but it does mean that we ought to worship in a way that understands that we believe in a God who is great like the one that we've described.